thematically a little bit different here, but uh, with my presentation as well, um, because I'm going to present some uh, numbers, uh, I thought it might make sense to have them on presentation on the wall. But first of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present a little bit of my personal research. I'm here as a, a step in for Gerd Pickel, but I can't really step in for him because um, he is such a great researcher. And I'm doing a, a little bit uh, different uh, research than him, but I think uh, I will contribute to the discussion and to the presentations we already heard. Uh, from an outsider perspective, uh, the sociological perspective on the question of the contribution of religions to the common good in the public society. So from the sociological understanding, the question posed here looks a little bit different. It is the question of how the common good can be defined in the first place, and it is sociology understands the common good as a contribution or contributing to common goods, with an S at the end. That means that it is the preservation of the creation or enforcing human rights. And these kinds of goods, they have a particular kind of problem or dilemma. Because in the sociological uh, experience, they look like these. You have the choice to contribute or to non-contribute to the pro production of these kinds of goods. And if everybody contributes, we will end here. The product, the, pro, uh, uh, the good will be produced, goods will be produced, and everybody can benefit from them. But if some people opt out and they are not going to contribute, that leaves the other people with a problem that they contribute and the goods might not be produced. So they are left with the costs. And because everybody tries to avoid to be left with the costs without having the benefits of the goods, normally the public goods, the common goods, and here they are not produced because nobody is going to contribute. That's called the free rider problem, and we face that when it comes to environmental problems, for example, or for the enforcement of human rights. And the sociological riddle here is how to transform these individual incentives not to contribute into the incentive to contribute to the common. So transforming individual benefits into social, societal benefits. And you might see that ties in uh, explicitly to the questions that are raised here, uh, coming from a little bit different perspective. So, uh, from the sociological perspective, the transformation involves two kinds of incentives that are basically norms, norms and sanctions. We are bound by norms in order to contribute to common goods. I will show some data about how religion is able, or religions are able to enforce, to support these kinds of norms necessary for the contribution to the common goods. And secondly, the second uh, solution to the transformation problem is trust. If we trust that everybody else is going to contribute, we have a high incentive to contribute ourselves. But how to come up with some kind of trust that says to us, okay, everybody else will tie in, so my contribution is not waste. And I will show some data how religion supports these kinds of trust in others to contribute to the common. That is discussed under the headline of uh, um, social capital, and maybe some people of you uh, know about this kind of concept. My research that I'm going to present is about Europe. It's an observation from Europe, and uh, this, ha this has two uh, uh, implications. The first implication is that Europe is always seen as a special case, as a special case of a secularized society. 
And secondly, it is quite easy to observe or to get some data, big data on hand in order to analyze the societal majorities in Europe. And I will exactly do that. So minority religious groups or uh, groups uh, uh, at all uh, are not considered here. I'm looking at the majority uh, society uh, groups. So this is probably a graph that is quite familiar to you. It shows the confessional distribution in all European member states from the European Value Survey 2008, which is a uh, comprehensive survey about value orientations of the European population. And you see that you can't see nothing because all the European societies are so different and if, everybody, if somebody tells you that there is a trend of secularization, this is not completely true. So the picture is quite diverse if you look at the uh, um, societies in Europe. We have societies that have about 70% of people that say that they are, are religious, that is the green bars. We have societies that have an orthodox majority, Protestant majorities, Catholic majorities, so the picture is really quite colorful. What does that mean for the production of norms and values through religion? If the picture is so colorful, it might be hard to detect trends, I thought, but to spoil a little bit, it is possible to find some. I used the value scale provided by Schwarz, which is an Israeli social researcher, and he um, was interested in similar questions, and therefore he developed a value scale that is, uh, that, uh, is measurable for all kinds of societies. At least he says so. He had done some uh, uh, tremendous research on that, and he could prove that his value scale can be measured in most of the societies of the world. He finds out that there are 10 different kinds of value orientations, which leads to four different kinds of values. We have a value that is called self-transcendence, which is composed of universalism and benevolence. And we would suspect that people that are religious in the European context would tie in exactly with that cluster. We have a cluster of values that can be called openness to change, which means that the people are interested in uh, uh, stimulation and that they are interested in how the future goes on. We have a cluster that is called self-enhancement, and uh, we might think that especially Protestants in Protestant societies would have some kind of a grip here. And we have a cluster that is called conservatism that comprises of security, uh, conformity, and tradition. And as I said, basically, we as social scientists at least would suspect that people that are highly religious would tie in with self-enhancement, the achievement part, and with the self-transcendence part. Um, and I looked at the European societies, at all European societies, I controlled for the country differences here, um, but I spare you the, the amount of data that I looked in, um, and I will guide you through these numbers here. As we as expected, People that are religious in the way that they say God matters in their everyday life, if they practice uh, religious rituals outside service, then they indeed favor values that are tied into self-transcendence. And we see that self-enhancement exactly can be found among uh, Protestants as well. But, and that's the big but, what we find as well is that Catholics are much more in self-enhancement than Protestants. That wasn't expected, and uh, it still is a little bit of a riddle to me, and maybe somebody uh, uh, from this audience can explain uh, these data to me. I would be very, very curious about that. Um, the thing that is most stunning is that it seems, regardless of the denomination people are uh, attached to, or affiliated to, they have an interest um, in conservatism, conservatism instead of openness to change. So openness to change seem not to be scheme 
of the denominations in Europe. And conservatism is supported by the intensity of belief, the practices of belief, and the amount of church uh, attendance. So, in fact, we observe that religious and non-religious people differ in their value orientations, in intensity and in direction. We observe as well differences in value orientations between the members of the different denominations, but they are less uh, pronounced as we would have expected. And in contrast to common knowledge, members of all denominations prefer traditionalism and conservatism over universalism and benevolence. So integration value orientation is more uh, via the mechanism of rule following than by universalism and benevolence. And therefore, it is really, really important to see and to look how religion uh, and religious teaching, different kinds of religious uh, teachings can support universalism instead of traditionalism and conf uh, conformatism. The intensity of individual beliefs and the religious practices outside service are less important than the church attendance. So being part of a group, an active part of the group, seems to be quite important in order to produce norm conformity and to uh, contribute to the common goods in this sense. Theological knowledge is less important than practicing uh, and being member of the imagined denominational community. Community. Doing religion is the point that makes a difference here. So this is the part of the value orientation. When it comes to trust in others, what is the role of religion here? Trust in others, and I have done some digging into data here as well, and you will see that the trust in others has different kinds of layers. It has an individual layer that is composed of denominational uh, affiliation as well as practices uh, uh, in the religious communities, but it has a structural perspective as well. The GDP, the state religion relationship, and the question, is there a religious majority, a distinct religious majority, seems to be important here as well. And uh, as I've done it before, I will guide you through this data field. Um, it seems, at least to the data in Europe, that uh, Catholicism and other kinds of religions, including Islam in Europe, um, seems to lower the trust in others. Um, at least when it comes to other religions, the explanation is quite easy. Uh, most of the other religions are in a diaspora, and that means that they have a particular uh, uh, kind of uh, threat to face because they have the majority that is always looking and watching, um, and it makes it uh, quite hard to become part of the society. Um, what I've said about uh, the norm conformity beforehand holds here as well in a quite distinct way. People that are part in the community, they develop a particular kind of general trust, and this kind is, is very, very high for the people working in the community, particularly if the community work is embedded in the religion of the religious majority, which can be seen here as a so-called interaction effect. So it's doing religion as well in this case that makes the difference. And it makes a difference how the state and the church interrelate. What we see here is that state, if the state church religion or state religion religion uh, relation is um, uh, organized in a way that there is one one state religion, then the trust of the people in general is really high. If there are several state religions or if there is no state religion, then the trust will be reduced. And as well, if there are uh, religious majorities, in particular Protestant majorities, the uh, trust is quite high. And uh, according to that data, I have to say, it's probably not an uh, effect of the religion per, per se or the religious majority, but probably an effect of the countries and the other country, uh, country 
uh, context variables that are characteristic for um, majority, uh, Protestant majority countries in Europe, which are basically the Scandinavian countries, and people in the Scandinavian countries are particularly trustful. There is a riddle be why that is the case. Religion probably is part of the story, but not the whole story. But at, uh, at least the data, the data show that there is something going on. Individual influences can be summarized in the way that being Catholic reduces trust, while Protestantism and Orthodoxy have no significant impact on the trust issue. Individual religious practices outside service and high uh, church attendance have no significant impact, but taking part in the community activates in, uh, activities uh, increases the trust clearly. That is the key figure for trust building. So people learn about other people, they meet other people, and they have the uh, possibility to talk and to take action with others, and that increases increases trust. The state religion relationship, as I said, as a contextual factor, has an impact as well. Several or non-established churches reduce general trust. One major uh, uh, church that ties in with the, with the state or has a close relationship increases trust. Societies with Protestant majorities tend to produce more general trust than other societies. And higher GDP increases trust as well which is part of the story that I tried to tell you for, uh, before a few minutes. So to sum up these two uh, uh, results, empirical results, religion has an impact on norm building and religion has an impact on the development of trust. Both are basic ingredients for overcoming the free rider problem. Both are important ingredients for contributing to common goods and therefore for the common good. And we can conclude here, religion matters for the development of societal norms and general trust. Even in Europe, religion still has the power to support contribution to the common goods. And this is part of the secularization story. If religion is lived, it has uh, a supporting contribution. But there is a but, as I said. Doing religion is more important than the mere belief, and it is, it is the involvement into a group of like-minded people that supports the development of norm compliance and general trust. And individual religiousness supports, supports uh, tradi traditionalism and rule compliance in general, while trust depends on the denomination, as we have seen before. In order to support the creation of general trust, individual religiosity has to be supported by contextual factors. And the first presentation already mentioned that the context is really, really important for how um, beliefs and how religions work and uh, how they can develop their powers. And secularization is not a single linear and coherent effect. The results clearly show here that it is necessary to differentiate between different levels of secularization and different dimensions of religion or religions. So these are some glimpses of the data that uh, sociologists work with and of the results uh, we came up with, and uh, uh, they can be found with different, with, with some, some kind of uh, um, uh, little differentiation in other data as well. So, thank you for your attention, and as a last little picture, these two aliens say, as near as I can tell, they are fighting over which religion is the most peaceful. And we hope that this is not what we experience at the moment. Thank you very much.